I'm very excited to present our next speaker. Uh, uh, Mauricio is uh, an incredible developer currently working at NYPL, the New York um, Public Library Labs uh, team, where he does some incredible design and development work. Uh, and I'm, I, I think we'll all really enjoy it. So give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Hola, uh, my name is Mauricio. I work at the New York Public Library. Uh, which is a li research and circulating library system that spans three boroughs in New York City, the Bronx, Staten Island, and Manhattan. 90 branches and four research centers. But I particularly work in this spectacular building. It's pretty cool going every day. It's the Ghostbusters building. <laughs> if you've seen it, uh, you should check it out whenever you're in New York and say hi. Uh, my team is called NYPL Labs. Uh, we are a, a small group trying to find new ways of engaging the public the, with the collections the library has. This is what we look like. This is an average photo of us. So, uh, <laughs> pretty white, lack of hair, and, but a lot of facial hair. So it would be cool to change that. Um, so I'm going to talk about maps, more specifically about the great map data extraction and adventure in three acts. But first, a prologue. Um, we're the Lionel Pincus and Princess Ferial Map Division in the New York Public Library, headed by this man, Matt Knudsen. He's the geospatial librarian of the New York Public Library. That's, that's not the most awesome job title. I don't know what is. Uh, he heads this division, and we have all these uh, this is uh, the, the map room. His, his office is behind those doors, you see, along with all, most of our maps. And these are, you know, what maps look like. A bunch of books, some uh, sheets also around. And so we have maps. We have the garden variety old map with incomplete continents. Uh, we also have these proposed maps of expansions of Manhattan in the Hudson <laughs> River. Uh, we also have maps engraved in ostriches in 1500, ostrich eggs. Uh, so this is apparently the earliest known uh, depiction of what Europeans called the New World. Uh, so about, in all, you know, 500,000 plus maps, 20,000 plus books and atlases. Uh, which have been recently released as the digitized versions of which have been released as public domain or actually CC0 uh, license. So you can, you know, download high resolution versions of these maps and do, you know, your punk band flyer. <laughs> so, you know, important scholarly work. Uh, but I'm going to talk about a specific set of maps. It's the Atlas of uh, insurance atlases. Uh, back in the day, and not so much today, but uh, these are the 1800s, uh, mid 1800s. Uh, uh, surveyors, insurance companies, would send surveyors throughout cities across the U.S. and Europe uh, to to draw each one of the buildings and color code them and do add some extra metadata, which would inform. Uh, in the case of an accident or something burns up, to estimate the value of the property and insurance claims and all that. So it looks like a very simple map. It's, it's a few rectangles and things like that, letters and colors. But in, in it, there's lots of data. We know the year of the map. We know street names. We know the use type of this building, commercial or residential. We know the name. You know, some cathedral or some uh, slaughterhouses are named in there. A uh, material of the building is color coded, so wood, brick, brownstones, the class, if it's high quality wood or low quality wood or whatever. Um, the address of the building, uh, let's see what else. If it has skylights in, in the roof, this is important for the, for, for the fire department to know. Uh, backyards and backlots, of course the geographic location of the building in, in, on Earth, and instead the building itself, the footprint, the shape of the building. So we got the, the, they were made, they, so they would draw one, let's say today we draw one map, and if something changes, they would not draw the whole map again. They would just cut up and overlay and make the changes on the map and publish a new atlas. So this, is, this, went, this went for several decades until the mid 
uh, 20th century. Uh, and so there's a lot of data trapped in a legacy format. <coughs> so we would like to get all these data, right? Uh, but, but why would you want this data, right? Uh, so to get an idea, this is what some projects of other institutions have done. This is every building in the Netherlands color-coded by year of construction. It's an amazing visualization. It's a map. You should check it out. This is um, the, the building patterns in Paris starting from the 1800s, every building uh, created uh, at the moment of their construction. Uh, it's a, you know, another pretty cool use of historical data. But you know, you don't have to go to the 1800s to find historical data. You know, Google Street, Google started taking pictures of the, your environment in 2007, and they just recently released a feature in Google Maps. I haven't found it. I just saw the news about it. That 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 you can overlay. You can you can see the different snapshots that Google cars have taken of a specific part of the city. So this is a, just a GIF animation of the construction of the uh, World Trade Center building. So yeah, back to our uh, Brooklyn, uh, our uh, atlases of insurance maps. So you can see these are very simple geometric shapes, right? Uh, so. Our first effort, this was, I personally had nothing to do with this. This is a like three or four years old project. We, we did um, uh, this web tool to let people or um, any user of this web tool to given a sheet of an atlas to geo, make it geo-aware. Basically, place it on top of OpenStreetMap, start tracing by hand all the buildings, and adding the street names and all that basically adding the data or extracting the data by hand out of each and every single sheet. <clears throat> so it is a very time consuming process. You know, you, you, you have to do a lot of work to, to extract a single polygon and everything. It's, it's a lot of work, you know? Um, so, you know, given the amount of maps we have, this, you know, probably by hand will take some while, right? It will take a while to extract for, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of pages we have with buildings in them. So back to our map. One, one step is digitizing the map, right? So before, before digitizing, if you didn't happen to live in New York City, you basically had no access to the map. You needed to go physically to a room, ask for a map, open it, look in the page you want, and see your building there. But you. Uh, Digitizing is one small step towards bringing these maps out. You know, this is what a map looks digitized. You put it on a thing, take a photo, you know, uh, composite the two uh, left and right pages of, of the book, and there you have. But this, you know, this is what it looks close by. It's a very plastic thing. You, you can see that they are hand colored, they are, there are different shades of green, there, there's a page that has been overlaid on top of the other one, and then on a second page overlaid on the previous one. So, so the, the color coding varies slightly, different blues, different reds, anyway. So the first part, the, the next step would be to make it geo-aware. The, so the, the scan page won't, if you're standing in the middle of Boston, you won't know if the map a given map is, is, is in Boston or not just by the scan of it. Maybe the person, maybe, maybe it depicts a block of Boston, but the person who added the metadata didn't specify that it's a, a block of the city of Boston, just block X, you know, the building, the, this building. So, so georectification is basically, this is a, a Mercator projection of, of Manhattan, of a block in Manhattan, so which means is a given block that has been scanned is, you know, distorted somehow to uh, make it match with with uh, with OpenStreetMap. The math is more complicated than just scaling and rotation. Just this an example. So the next step would be to trace every single building in that in that page, you know, which is basically doing this, right? which by hand takes a while, right? So 
how long? About 120,000 footprints were produced in about three years by staff and volunteers. So there has to be a better way. Ah, well, 120,000. Oh, that's a lot, right? This is about just Manhattan and Queens for one year, 1853. So, so, so yeah, you, you know, <laughs> there has to be a better way, right? Uh, um, so we need to find out if, you know, if this is possible. We went, we, every, lots of companies and people come and go in, in, through the New York Public Library, and every time we get an opportunity with somebody who has done some work in GIS, we ask, hey, I mean, these maps look pretty like, simple to do. They, is there something you can share? You know, do you know a way of extracting automatically the data out of this? And you know, nobody would really, yeah, we'll get back at you. And, you know. Until we run into this guy, you know, you might meet the, you know, the guy on the left. Uh, he spoke earlier today, John Resick. We were talking about his, he was talking about his Japanese uh, work. And, and you were like, hey, do you know, uh, we want to digitize these maps uh, computationally. Do you know uh, if that, who ca has done that? And he's like, I don't work with maps, but my brother, he works in archaeology, and I've heard he's done some map work. So let me get in touch, you two in touch. We send a few emails, and he sent us back, like kind of like a workflow. It, it wasn't, it was like, if it were to be computationally done, it could be done like this, and, and there was some software involved, a lot of hand meddling, but we were like, could we automate this in some way, right? So, well, <laughs> why not, right? <laughs> so before I go, Further, I would, I, I mean, all the code that is going to be mentioned here is going to is is in public repositories and and this presentation itself I'm going to publish on the web somewhere, so I'm going to tweet it. So so you know just don't be worrying about like writing down exactly a URL that you know means the site. I'm going to go really fast. So first of all, we need to define what the building is for our specific need for this specific map this doesn't you know, this won't generalize for every single map in the world or whatever you know uh, so this is an example of a, of a, a snippet so it's completely enclosed by black lines uh, dashed lines do not count as walls um, has to be more than 20 square meters uh, area less than 3,000 square meter area we'll talk about why that is the case and it has to be not the color of paper right uh, so the process itself is, is in this repository, and I did a paper on it, uh, which I had the opportunity to talk about in, in the ACM Geospatial Conference, which was pretty cool. Um, and this is basically a, a Frankenstein of spaghetti code that <laughs> is articulated by a Python script, you know, <laughs> Vital, R, GIMP, Image Magic, OpenCV. This is our reference map. This is one base uh, image we're going to work with. So the first thing we need, we're going to go through our checklist, right? Whoops, sorry. Uh, so it should be, it's uh, completely enclosed by black lines, and dashed lines do not count. So we first of all need to provide the best possible input image. In when, as you can see, the the building. Th this is clearly handmade. There are some lines missing. There's this. Uh, uh, collage happening, fading, paper, all that. So the, there's also the wear and tear and uh, fading colors in sheets. So these are all limitations we have to work with. And it, also in the process of georectification, which distorts the image and creates new pixels and destroys others, um, this process of destroying and creating pixels is called resampling. And and the, the different alg uh, resampling algorithms will produce different results. In our case, cubic resampling was better. As you see, there are broken lines down in the right-hand side, and we don't want that based on our previous definition. So the first thing, once you've done that, the first thing you would do is make a binary bitmap, which basically means make it black and white. Uh, you provide a, a range of colors and any, any, any color above this value will be black. Any color below this value will be white. You, the image needs to suffer some additional transformation. But this is what we call a threshold image. And then we proceed to polygonize 
this image, which basically means running a Python program on it and producing a vector value that is something like this. It's a very rugged little polygon, which what it, what it does is just takes everything that is white, then extracts a, a vector out of it. Everything that is black, contiguously black, then extracts. So that's where the area enters into question. Those little circles would be polygons, and the circles inside the circles is another polygon, and that little thing up there is another one polygon. So we need to exclude all those. And the streets themselves, as you see in the edges, are, are, are also polygons. So we need to exclude those polygons that are too big or too small to be buildings. And, and we need to simplify it, right? So we need to exclude these buildings. So given that, right? So this is one example of those uh, buildings uh, or those polygons. Uh, and we would like something resembling this shape that is in red. And so this goes through a process that in R that is uh, an alpha shape convex hull with a sample point set, which if you are interested in that, there's some links for that, uh, which basically means that you have a given set of points and different uh, parameter values would give you a tighter fit to those, uh, an enclosing polygon to those points, and a, and a wider parameter will give you a less, a single polygon, but with less detail. So, so we want a point in between. We want the detail of the polygon, but we want only one polygon. <clears throat> so we need a set of points first. We extract a set of points of this guy using this function in R. Uh, we can extract hexagonal grid, a uh, rectangular grid of points, or a random grid of points, and then we actually do all of those to find, and it's like kind of brute force, because not every time we will, pr we will be able to generate uh, a satisfying uh, shape. So, so we go through all of them, and then uh, we alpha shape this uh, set of points. And this is an example where, where we lost that L shape in the process of alpha shaping. It's an intentionally bad uh, example to show you what could happen. There are other point reduction algorithms. We didn't know this then. We know it now. If anyone wants to collaborate with that, it's open repo. We will be definitely uh, appreciate that help. Uh, so now we need to know what's a building and what is not, right? And this, what we do is try to find anything that is not paper colored. So what we do is, given, given the resulting simplified polygon, we cookie cut that uh, polygon from the map, find the average uh, color, and compare it to a list of approved or unapproved colors. If it's closer, it's uh, just a basic uh, Euclidean distance. If it's close to paper, we ignore it. Uh, which the end result is something like this, given this image, the resulting polygon. So it's not perfect, but this is good enough for us. Some polygon is better than no polygon. Uh, so. <laughs> So, as you, so you get an idea. This is a bigger part of New York City. <clears throat> this is the result before, after, before, after. So there are some false positives, some false negatives. But overall, it's a pretty decent result, very uh, encouraging. Um, another one. We lost a whole block of brownstones there. Um, so checklist complete. But also. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we did a little bit of, of computer vision uh, to try and find little circles and crosses in the, in the buildings. Those mean something. We have also false positives there. But this is very primitive work. If somebody knows better computer vision, that would also be a huge plus. In the end, this is what it looks like. You just say vectorize. You give an image, uh, a georeferenced image press enter and wait 10 minutes, and you get a shape file and a GeoJSON file, <clears throat> right? So in this process, we managed to produce 66,000 footprints in one day. This is this machine running linearly. I, no, I think I had two processes going on, but so you get an idea if you add, this can scale, and, and the fastest we could produce in this machine was for a sheet of Manhattan blocks, which is about six or seven Manhattan blocks. It's 10 minutes 
of processing time. This is for an 1859 Atlas of Manhattan. <clears throat> Uh, some caveats, adjacency is not enforced, so buildings do not fit each other very nicely. You know, they are a little separate. There are false positives and negatives, and some, there are some overlapping cases, but you know, it's not so bad. So now, the second part, we need to see if this is good data or not, right? Um, before, the, we, we are hugely inspired by the work of Suniverse, and I don't know if anyone is familiar with them. It's a group that is in, based in the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and Oxford University. So, so they, what they do is scientists have lots of data that they cannot computationally uh, process, and they g go to Suniverse and tell them, hey, we, 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 need, we don't have enough PhD people to go through all this data. Uh, but you know, you you have access to thousands of people. Show them this data, and let's have the crowd classify the information. Um, but and they receive things like this. This is uh, Planet Hunters, and and for those who are educated in astronomy, they will find a pattern there, saying like, oh, this looks like it could be a planet or not, right? And and you and multiple people. This way, they found a binary system. I mean, you should go. I, I won't do justice describing it. So, so go to planethunters.org and Suniverse and check it out. But this was a huge reference for us, basically taking the, the task of, of, of a, like a scholar or a very specialized person and cutting it down into bite-sized, fun-sized pieces to then have many eyes going through the same piece of data and let a consensus surface on its own. In some, with some mathematical criteria. <clears throat> For in our case, it's validating these footprints, and knowing if, if anything is, if this is correct, or how correct, or how incorrect this is. But the question for us was, are people willing to spend time checking building footprints, yeah. right? This is not the most, I mean, this is not planets, or, you know. So, so we, th this was something that we wanted to test, right? So. We made the building inspector. This is the URL. Uh, this was a few months ago. Uh, the code is here. And this is basically what it looked like. I am showing you the compressed like, a m version, like a, how it looks like in a smartphone. Uh, you are given a polygon overlaid on the, on the map itself. And you are asked to tell, you, to tell us if it's correct, if it's incorrect or if it's almost correct, just needs some fixing, <clears throat> right? There's a, a you have a count of all the polygons you've checked, and you can tweet that number <laughs> from there, <laughs> right? <laughs> so another thing people can do was going to see their progress. So OK, these are all the buildings I've inspected. Let's check them out. And you were shown. You know, all the little buildings, the greens are yeses, the yellows are noes, the reds are fixes, uh, the reds are noes, the yellows are fixes. And then, and they could also go and see what the consensus is. It's looking at all the inspections for every uh, building in, in the data set. And this is the consensus view. So uh, three or more people have looked at these polygons, and 75% of them have agreed that it's a yes, a no, or a fix. So, Seeing lots of green is good. Um, about a month later, we saw things. This is during a month, you know, things like this, right? Uh, this, Whoa. right? <laughs> so, so it, over the, uh, overall, about 420,000 flags have been produced. A flag being a yes, a no, or a fix by a person <coughs> for 70,000 plus unique poly polygons. And the important part: 84% are yes in consensus and 7% are fixes. So it's, for us, it's pretty good results. Um, so basically, you know, <laughs> this blew our minds. You know, people are willing, after all, to <laughs> contribute, right? Uh, because this is all f f like free. Right? There is no uh, other incentive you know, to do this. Uh, so well, uh, now our final act uh, is Given that people are willing to go through this task, we have a lot of stuff we want to extract to, from these maps, right? Uh, street names, all these. So what we did was, informed by 
this uh, acceptance of our building inspector, the, the map curator, the, the geospatial librarian, and as we, we, we de define like what would be like a way to divide and conquer these tasks and select three tasks out of these. What, what would be the most in informative, ta uh, 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 what, what is the most precious information that we, would, what, that we would want to get out of this data set, right? So we decided that the address was very important, the material the building was made, which is in the color of the building, and the footprint itself being fixed. Then the fix is needing to be fixed. So what the, the flow goes something like this, a building is checked. If it's a yes, it gets sent to an address and color task or a color task, uh, and if it's a fix, it gets sent to a fixed task, uh, which then would be sent to a yes task to, to either the address or the color. Uh, if it's being marked as no, get ignored. So we needed to do uh, interfaces. So the simplicity, one of the things we think is uh, was part of the success of the first version was the simplicity, just yes, no, fix, yes, no, fix. You could, that, that's what uh, we think was, so we needed to do that for these other three tasks. How to make an easy addresser, how to make an easy color selector, and how to make an easy fixer. So these are videos of the new tasks. Uh, you get presented as a fixer, so you, you get presented a polygon with some control points, and you, you, know, you get to delete, add new control points, and, and move it around, and uh, Chan, 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 save, right? This is a case for a building, for a polygon that encloses three buildings, so you would select the, the multiple polygon uh, option, and you go and you know move it around. I should have done it in faster speed, but da, 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 da. So I wanted you to show you, you one thing, so you add it, and you get shown the polygon again, and you can add as many polygons. Some, some polygons enclose five or six buildings. And this is the addresser. You see a number next to the building, click on it, type it. Say, you see an address next to the building, click on it, type it. Next, many, many buildings do not have addresses, and many buildings have multiple addresses, so we want them all. You would click on all the addresses you see, and go on, right? Please try it, <laughs> contribute to the, you know, Ah, well, and there's one more task, which is classifying color, which unfortunately is not very color blind friendly, or not at all color blind friendly. These colors are faded and, you know. But anyway, you would select, click on the color you see in the, in the building being enclosed by the polygon. If it's multiple color, you select multiple and select as many colors as the building has and go on. The, the textures of, of the buttons are, are based on, on the, on the map itself, so you can drag it and see there's some problems in distinguishing the blue from the green. So, so anyway, classify color. The resulting data is available via an API, and, and you know, it looks something like this. It's just GeoJSON that you can then copy and paste and do whatever you want with it. Uh, hopefully lots of interesting research, like producing cool t-shirts. Um, <laughs> So this is not the end. The, the, the idea would be, as John mentioned earlier, to, for example, extend these tasks to, for people to do it in the subway, or you know, there are many more data points that we need to extract out of the building inspector, but this is just a continuation of this story. So, gracias. <laughs> <laughs>